Mr. Wetbread, when can we expect the first brain transplant? Oh, I don't know anything about the brain. I've been working on the other extremity. The feet? The pink. Oh, you mean the male organ? One usually does mean the male organ when one refers to the pink, as opposed to the female organ, which is known as the vagina. Drop it a bit. Eskimo Nell, scene 69, take two. He was a great artist. And a bloody good screw. Welcome to the Prince Charles Cinema here in the West End of London. We're here tonight for the first exclusive presentation of Doing Rude Things, a history of that most criminally neglected field of cinema, the British sex film, a genre which, according to esteemed critic David McGillivray, involved absolutely nothing of the slightest importance or interest. But then he was probably sitting in the front row. The British sex film holds a special place in the national psyche. None of us, I'm sure, will ever forget the poignant, almost painful pathos of I'm not feeling myself tonight, the haunting tranquility of Can I Come Too, or the timeless universal beauty of Snow White and the Seven Perverts. These films were attended by a remarkable cross-section of the public, people of differing ages, both male and female, from all walks of life. Of course, it hasn't always been socially acceptable to go and see a sex film, and to actually appear in one was to court shame and public disgrace. The earliest British sex films were made in the 1950s, all of them shot in nudist camps. In those days, it was important there shouldn't be any suggestion of sex. Only healthy outdoor pursuits were shown, like badminton, volleyball or trampolining, anything that made the breasts bounce up and down, basically. It was in the 60s that the sex film proper began and that Soho became the Hollywood of the British sex film industry. The directors of the early films took enormous risks. Stanley Long, Derek Ford, Peter Walker. Another was the director of Some Like It Cool, a young Michael Winner. All these people risked being ostracised from polite society. Though in Michael Winner's case, this was nothing to do with his films. Curiously, when we spoke to these directors, none of them seemed pleased to be reminded of their early work and refused to take part in the programme. It was in the 70s that the big studios moved in and put real money into sex films. Oh, that was terrific, though. That was absolutely terrific. I'm glad, Timmy, but there's something you ought to know. Yes? I mean, I don't want you to go through life with a fetish. What do you mean? You've just had my suspender belt. Unlike sex films in other European countries, all ours were comedies, which is probably more a reflection on our sex lives than on our sense of humour. The 80s signalled the end of the British sex film, which is why doing rude things fulfills such an important sociological function, an in-depth retrospective which puts these films in their proper social context. Excuse me, would you mind removing your hat? It was quite a vogue, these little 8mm home movies, just a little story, using the nude carefully. So we began, we got a Bolex camera and we set it all up. And I did one uh, which was a strip called Excitement. She's got to have a perfect body. 
She's got to have firm breasts, slim waist, good legs, attractive. It isn't essential to be beautiful. It's the body that counts. Normally, with most of my stuff, you'll see her unturned in profile. And when I did a marvellous thing, I got hold of a bright red wig and I changed into another character. And she was called Rita Landry and she's here. And she was Parisian. She worked as a trapeze artist, so they could never get hold of her. She was five foot nine and spoke no English. She's the one that can do the wet shirt and the, and the torn skirt and all the looking into camera and the little corsets and the rest of it. That was her job. And the corset is the one that was used for Peeping Tom. That was me with a Cecil Beaton hat. Again, the pubic hair is missing. Come on, Sonny, make us famous. My nudes started to appear in magazines and people said, God, we've never seen stuff like this before. Because the girls look real for a change, you know. And, th and that's how it took off. And I obviously had an eye for line. And uh, my pictures look good. I used to put all the cash in the drawer and try not to touch it. And I had a count up, and I said, George, you know how much money we've got? And he said, I haven't a clue. I said, we've got a thousand pounds. So I said, why don't we start our own magazine? That's how Camera came about. There was not that many on the market. I think ours was the first one. <coughs> Morning, Mr. Peter. Morning. Can I have a crunch, please? Help yourself, my dear. Thank you. How much each? Uh, five shillings each, sir. Oh, well, I'll have that one. Yeah. Oh, and that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> How much would the lot be? And, of course, in those days, one had to shave. You couldn't show pubic hair. So uh, that was something I had to do. Um, all models did it, and it, it didn't really matter. You used to have retouchers that would take out anything that was showing. Well, it was considered indecent. I suppose the idea was that the nude was a sort of impersonal thing, a sort of a statue. Uh, anything like that, underarm hair, anything had to be taken off. Unless it was for Germany, and then you were indecent if you didn't have it. <laughs> On the bed here are some of the little boards that used to be the, the beginning of the home movies. You'd have a picture, and then the, that was to advertise the little films. And I used to do the, the boards for them. Instead of just having a girl standing there doing a strip tease, I devised little stories to, to, to go with them. And it progressed from there. Now this is the window dresser that caused all the problems. Anyway, I did this particular film in 1961. And it was quite popular, and it sold. And then in 1964, we were summoned to appear at Clerkenwell Court on a charge of, of obscenity. Court was adjourned while they went and got a copy of the, of the window dresser, and we all came back again. The judge said, I'm going to see this, and I suggest the jury come with me. So they all trailed off, and they saw this film, and they came back, and they said, hmm. I think we'll have another look. So they all trailed off and saw it again. Three times they did this. And the judge came back and said, I'll buy a copy for my son's case dismissed. This is the world we live in. Exciting, fast-moving, noisy. Laboring under constant high pressure, our nerves are strained to the utmost. Many people nowadays are beginning to find that they can only keep pace with modern life by spending more of their leisure hours in natural surroundings. But those who call themselves naturists go further. Well, I decided to make a propaganda film way back in sort of mid-50s on naturism because I thought it would be a bigger thing to, to show it to the public. But generally speaking, we were aiming at societies and clubs 
We had no idea it would get to the public cinema. Encouraged by my continued privacy, I started to sunbathe completely naked. I began to find a delight in having a deep, all-over suntan, which was the envy of all my friends. I don't mean the all-over part, of course. I would have been horrified at the thought of anyone seeing me. I think it's a good thing to show that the naked body is nothing wrong with it, but unfortunately people cannot get it from their minds that if you take the clothes off, you're immediately going to, to do something sexy, which is not true at all. Animals don't run around and perform sex all the time. They don't wear clothes. One warm summer day, my dog and I were dozing blissfully in the sun, when suddenly there were people all around me. I was shocked. I'd been discovered. But they didn't seem to worry very much. Goodness, the girl's coming over. She looks friendly enough. So you're naturists. Thanks for coming over and telling me. Naturists? What in heaven's name does she mean? You know, I've never been able to understand all this mixed up talk about naturism or nudism or whatever it's called. I'm a naturist. I've been one all my life. I was even born naked. And I just can't see why I shouldn't be openly proud of the body I was given instead of having to hide it furtively all the time. It seems sort of dishonest. And it certainly causes a lot of bother with non-naturist boys. Poor fellows, they seem to have only one obsession. Isn't it pathetic? Pity they don't know what it's like to be free from all that. Life's such fun. unnecessary to shoot the other two, Sunswept and, and Eve's on skis, um, because had I not shot them, I would have been far better off if I'd just gone ahead and exploited the one film which was a breakthrough. Worldwide, I would have probably made hundreds of thousands more, but in fact, I didn't do that. I tried to make a better film, and by so doing, I lost the initiative. Uh, everyone else jumped on the band bandwagon, and the professionals started coming into the filmmaking of nudes. The other girls are going that way, too. But first of all, they've got to pick up Jackie, the baby of the party. Well, you know, I was given some advice. They said, well, look, you know, don't start shooting the film like this until you've shown it to John Trevelyan, because, you know, if you've made the film and he says, no way... It comes down to the sincerity, or I would use the word integrity, I think, of the person who's making the film. Now, how does one assess it? Of course, the real judgment must come off the screen, but I've made it uh, my business and my pleasure to getting to know filmmakers personally, filmmakers not only in this country, in the United States and in other countries. The more you get to know a filmmaker, the more you can assess his own personal integrity. It is, if you can prove to me that it's, you know, it, it is genuine, and you've got someone who of some authority in it, I might consider it. The working title was Cornish Holiday. So we, we had no script, there was never any script. And we started sort of wandering down through the West Country. We stopped at Stonehenge, and clothed, and we wandered down to Woolacombe Beach, clothed. Three quarters of it was a glamorised travelogue. You, ne you, you never saw a nipple. And then eventually we came round to Bedruth and Steps and no one had tested the tides, of course. So that is where this long walk began. It started right out beyond the rock. And I was to walk slowly into camera and stop. Now, you can't see, but I, the, the pubic hair is not on. So you had to be very careful how you walked. You walked actually bringing your leg across. I was quite neatly made, so I was, but I had a towel as a standby just in case. And I walked across here, and George said, oh, just tread in that pool. Well, no one had measured the pool. It was six foot deep. So I sort of shot out there and continued the walk and stopped just on my marks there. And that was the opening shot. But 
to do a film with nudes in, you had to hang it on some sort of a peg. So they made it, oh yes, these people are all naturists. And they got hold of Charles McCaskey from Spielplatz, and, and he said, yes, well, if you use the place, obviously, he would say that this was the thing, and then Trevelyan said, all right, I will pass it. If the reason for them trailing all the way around the West Country is that they stand start naked in Spielplatz, which is what we did. After a dignified and friendly welcome from the president of the club and his wife, one of the members is asked to show the girls around. Say, that boy's got muscles in places I haven't even got places. Let's not beat around the bush. Uh, films like this were not being made for the delectation of naturists. They were made for the men in the max who liked a little bit of female pulchritude and suddenly they got it. It was such a breakthrough because up until that time naked breasts of white women had not been seen on the screen. The lure of the sea, the sun and the sand proves too strong. And the longing to move free as the air, truly as nature intended, is overwhelming to Pam, Petrina and Jackie. Making that fateful decision proves a bit difficult. Well, here goes. Even with a three category system, they were never passed higher than the A category. They never even reached the X category. And I think this is one of the reasons why uh, the Nature's films disappeared. Because, okay, some people may want to go and see nature, Nature's films because they may be naturists. But as far as getting any kind of an erotic charge out of it, it just wasn't there. Because there'd been a relaxation in moral attitudes in this country, uh, and around the world for that matter, the sex film suddenly took precedence because what was once forbidden fruit became almost acceptable for people to see. Sex personified in one kiss. Seven decades later, another kiss. And another. Another. And another. Sweet and sexy. Sweet and sexy. The adventures of a man in search of his sister. I had the opportunity of taking over a, a strip club which had been closed down and uh, at a very low rent in the middle of Piccadilly. I opened at 10 o'clock in the morning till 3 o'clock the next morning and managed to do nine shows a day in continuous performance. We used to wear the prints out every two months, but at least we stayed open and we took in a little cinema in the middle of the West End. I took £4,000 a week. Boris, did you lock the back door and let out the cat? And did you put the rubbish out? And I hope you didn't dirty the kitchen floor when you came in. And you can stop that. I'm tired, I've got a headache. Let's go to the pictures, you say. Nice film on at the local, you say. And what's it about, may I ask? Sex. Disgusting. And I remember the first one I saw, I saw it in a crowded cinema in the West End. And I started laughing a third of the way in, and the chap who was with me, who was, who was going to be the director of the film, Sweet and Sexy, he said, don't laugh, he said, you're supposed to be taking it seriously. And I said, I can't take that seriously. He said, I know, he said, but everybody else does. And I said, these are the Dirty Max. He said, do you see how many Dirty Max you see around? And when the lights went up for the ice cream interval, the age range spanned everybody from 18 to 81. When permissiveness raged in the 60s and 70s, most Western countries were producing sex films, but only Britain was producing sex films that were not sexy and that were cut to ribbons by the censor. And yet they still filled cinemas from Land's End to John O'Groats. Ah, good morning, sir. A young lady, I wonder if you'd mind clearing some of the rubbish by the stage door. Half a mouse, sir. I'd do it right away. <laughs> It was an idea I had, nine ages. It sounded good. Actually, it was going to be seven ages, <laughs> but it, it wasn't long enough, so I made it nine ages. <laughs> I think I got the idea. John Gilgul was, was, was playing at the Globe, doing a one-man show called The Seven Ages of Man. <laughs> I think that's what started it off.
I had a hundred and I think a hundred and twelve girls in all in the film. Well, that was commercial. I mean, people who saw the name Harrison Marks up up, up on a up on a billboard, they knew what they were going to get. Ah, take you to the extermination centre. Mm, I think I will keep this one. Ah, isn't he cute? <laughs> Animal, kill him with the rest. We'll keep the one we already have. I never have seen one as big as that before. Actually, some of the famous faces that have made appearances in sex films over the years are quite startling. Dana, Captain Birdseye, Gavin Campbell from That's Life. You'd be amazed, who else? Okay, go put your clothes on and we'll explain what you have to do later. Thank you. Oh, Fontaine, you're positively wicked, you know that? <laughs> yes, I am, aren't I? I knew I should have gone into the movies. Instead of wasting my best years modeling. Yes, well, uh, let's waste no more time then, as I believe the film is about to start. Now, I guess Benny's told you how I want the script. I don't want any bullshit. What I need is 90 minutes of good, solid, hardcore pornography. Okay? And you, Dennis. None of that simulated crap. I want to see everything. So you shoot it for real. I want to see girls being whipped. Plenty of flagellation. Bondage. Rubber appliances. Leatherware. Chains, lesbianism, kinky gadgets, and you can throw in a bit of bestiality at the same time. Then, in the second scene, we'll make... Dennis, this is your Eskimo now. Hi there, boy! I was sent scripts that I really thought no, because that meant sort of front bottoms and back bottoms and things <laughs> excuse my childish language but I will use that no I will not I, I will not sort of uh, have anything to do with, with that kind of filming no my dear mother and um, grandmother saw that I was starring in in the Bogner picture drome <laughs> and uh, oh you know off they went to see it and I didn't know that they were going. <laughs> I'd have warned them. Uh, and they sort of came out, as they said, they, they thought they were some quite strange people that were going into the cinema. Good morning, milady. A beautiful day. The sun's in the sky and Lord Kushoot is in his bath. Oh, breakfast. I really feel like it this morning. Good to start the day on something hot. I do agree. A roll, perhaps? Exactly, Hampton. <clears throat> Always my pleasure to serve, milady. My first film in this uh, genre was a film called Come Back Peter, which was really a development of Alfie, the Alfie theme. In Alfie, I mean, there was a boy going around London supposedly seducing all these women, but you didn't see anything in that at all. I took it a stage further, actually, and you did see some sex in it, actually. You saw this butcher's delivery boy fantasizing as he went around his, his relationships with all these different customers of his, actually. And uh, so we saw some sex. What's going on? 
I thought I... Look, I'm all... But then we had trouble, with, as I say, with the censor, because the censor uh, was rather reluctant. It was always a question of pushing, pushing, pushing with the censor. What can we get away with? Oh, God! <laughs> I make a conscious effort to be objective about pictures, and I think people who work with me do the same thing, but it is difficult. Now, there's one way to be consistent, and that is have a set of rules which you apply to every picture, but you've got to apply them rigidly to a, a masterpiece or to a piece of rubbish. The sex films were still cut to ribbons. He didn't like that sort of thing, and uh, we're told now that uh, if he got turned on, he cut it out. It was just a, a matter of taste as far as he was concerned. As long as everything was done in the best possible taste, uh, it was passed for general consumption. But of course, you couldn't uh, talk about taste uh, and a British sex film in the same sentence. Female pubic shots uh, have always been acceptable ever since John Trevelyan passed the first pubic hair in, in reasonable close-up in a film called Hugs and Kisses in 1968. The penis, I'm afraid, is still not really acceptable even in these days. Disgusting. There was a film called Sex Thief which we passed in 1973 and I've got some notes here uh, showing the sort of cuts that we made. For example, the opening copulation intercut with the titles must be reduced, in particular those shots showing the man between the woman's legs and the final violent orgasm. Uh, the intercut sex scene with a wrestling match must be reduced. No, please. Please, no. Yes. The long copulation scene where Grant has Isabel seven times, lucky man, must be considerably reduced, including the speeded up sex. Uh, remove dialogue. Ooh, it's someone's prick. It's very unusual to actually have a dialogue cut in those days. The sex scene between Grant and Angie, where a stimulator, that is what it's called in the film, is used, must be considerably reduced. The scene in which the in the morning where she rolls on him and starts to rub, uh, uh, rub, to, to make love again. Bottom shots must be removed. Uh, they're just examples from one film. There had to be sexual encounters at specific points throughout the film, usually every five minutes. Crap! You're too arty. Take this scene with the shy young virgin. Please be gentle. No man has ever made love to me before, and I'm just a little frightened. Why can't you just say I ain't never been fucked before? Pages of dialogue would be cut because it was totally unnecessary. Cut all this, get them down to the action again. Okay, Penelope, it's your turn. Oh, goody, maybe he'll wake up and get one. Penelope, this is no time for joking. despite what people might imagine. You, in fact, you didn't carry out an audition where you asked people to take their clothes off in front of you and an audition for a love scene or whatever that particular time. I mean, auditions were carried out very much as you would for any film. And Sonia, and Sonia I'd like you to meet uh, Bachu Sen. Uh, Hello. Producer Ken Cole. Uh, hi. Can you sit down there's a chair that's behind you, Sonia? Uh, this one here? The first question is... Um, that the, the picture itself has scenes of explicit sexual of explicit sexual nature in it. And the first question we have to ask is whether that bugs you at all. Um, I mean, performing in such scenes. I mean, they're all strictly simulated, of course. Yes. I don't want to know any specific detail, details. We just want to know whether you, in fact, object, basically, so that we can then proceed to the other more important aspects, you know, like the acting and experience and things like that. Of course. That. So, do you have any basic objections to it? No, not really. Not if it's as a you know, part of the part, so yeah, to speak. Right. You well, know. Okay. That's the main, that's the first hurdle. And nudity is only uh, used to attract people to look at the subject. In other words, 
if it's a film which has got nudity, you will probably all look at it and say, well, you know, not that you are going to go and pay your money to see it, but you, you will think about it. In other words, it's a way to get into people's mind. And, um, but eventually, the, if it is a, a film with feelings about eroticism, it should really come through acting. They sort of came round about, they didn't actually come straight out to say that they wanted to include a lot of nudity, etc. It was that they would like a drama in which you know, nudity was an ingredient. Uh, I didn't really realise at that time to what extent the nudity would be, but my enthusiasm and excitement was such, you know, the opportunity to direct a feature film, which is something I've been longing for and dreaming of for a long time, um, I said yes. You know, to be honest, I think I would have said yes to anything at that time. End of a journey, start of a new life in the tinsel world. Not as British as you thought, am I? Stop! Her private hell. Well, all the girls we used had been actor actresses of some sort or other, albeit sometimes just models. Um, he would just turn up with a load of photographs. Be quite honest, we were only looking at meat. Of course, I'll only strip off if the part calls for it. The point is you're going to have to strip off. Oh, that's all right. And do sex scenes. Oh, yes, I don't mind that. In lots of different ways. Yes, that's fine. But it's quite a good acting part. Acting? Acting? You didn't say I'd have to act. Look, I don't mind getting screwed, but I'm not doing any of that acting stuff. What sort of girl do you take me for? I was never a dumb blonde. I did it to survive. I did it to uh, further my career, which it did. Um, I had uh, the sexual kind of charisma, which I still have today. You didn't actually have to have an act acting ability, but you did have to have something kind of uh, sexuality. You need to, to project something towards the camera for you to... Uh... My mother had to sign a consent at the time. So she, she did it, and she had no idea what I had to do, and I had no idea what I had to do. So he said, uh, he said, well, we were, on, we were on, the, uh, on the film set, and he said, well, you know what you have to do now? You've got to take your clothes off. I said, what? Oh, no, 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 you're not doing this to me. He said, oh, yes. I said, I can't, I can't do it, I can't do it. And he said, well, I tell you what, we'll take you into the pub and give you some brandy. Would that be all right? Took 20 brandies later, I took my clothes off. <laughs> I can't, and I certainly don't remember Francoise being nervous. If she was nervous, she obviously hid it very well. Uh, on whether 20 brandies was the way she did it, although I would have thought, I would have noticed it more after 20 brandies. Um, as I said, if she was nervous, she certainly covered it very well. And there was, in fact, no problems whatsoever when it came to the scenes where she did have to remove her clothing. Can you manage a paper too? Oh, just put it on top, Monsieur. Ah. <laughs> ah. Ah, what a place to have the times. The fact was that I refused to be nude in that film, totally refused. And they had, you know, my... They had actually a scene where I was outside the window, um, had to put somebody else's bottom. I thought you French girls were supposed to like it. I never said we didn't like it. Oh, good. Oh, Rogers! You beast! Mm. But it was so funny seeing this brown face outside because I just came back from the south of France. <laughs> little you know, white bottom. Knocking the, the carpet out, and, and all of a sudden you see this little white, white bottom, bottom by the back. <laughs> and you go, wait a minute, this is going too far. You could have put some brown, you know. It could have been on a belt my bottom there instead of yours, you know. You would have wished, darling. You would have wished. You don't have such a great bottom like Mary Millington oh, had. Oh, yes, I did. Her That's bottom was absolutely gorgeous. That's the difference between you and me now. Oh, I still have that bottom. Do you want it? I don't. It was a standard practice for there to be two versions of the film. 
I mean, people still talk about two versions, but that really doesn't exist now. But at that time, it, it was. You did the UK version. Um, and then, in other words, you would do a shot with the, the people in a certain amount of clothing. And then you would do, once that, you were happy with that take, you would then do another take, which was regarded as the foreign version, in which you, everything would be the same, the dialogue, the action, it's just that the, the people would uh, wear a lot less or nothing at all, you know, <laughs> otherwise it would be the same. And so, yes, yeah, certainly there were two versions. I knew that they did shoot porn versions. They didn't do anything of things like Confessions of a Window Cleaner. I think that it was the lesser ones I did, maybe, uh, low budget ones. Uh, and then I, yes, I did know, and I, I knew that there were certain days, certain evenings, that it was porn yeah. days. Stop the film, you've got to stop the film. You've got the wrong version. You're too late, mate. It's on. Hello, Nell. Hello, Dick. You want to fuck? What was extraordinary about the 70s in, uh, in this country was that soft porn was suddenly booming at a time when it was stone cold dead throughout the rest of the world because hardcore had taken over. Because hardcore has always been illegal in this country, uh, this was a time in the 70s when suddenly the majors who realized that there was money involved in making sex films could take over. And they'd asked everybody, Richard Beckinsale, all my peers at the time, Richard O'Sullivan, Dennis Waterman and everybody, and uh, they'd all turned it down, thought it was rubbish. And uh, I uh, read it again and I read it again, and I suddenly saw here was a chance, actually, to make sex funny. This is your life, Timmy Lee. It may not always turn out how you want it to be. Of course, the amazing thing about this studio, Elstree, is um, I must have had sex everywhere in this room. Funny boy. What are you going to, what sort of sexy are we going to get here? This is, um, yes, I think it's going to take a bit of bounce. Um, talking a bit of bounce, Liz Fraser was in, it's amazing, amazing the, the women that were in these films as well. There was uh, Jill Gascoigne, uh, Pamela Stevenson, um, Liz Fraser. Um, see, everybody wanted to be in films. Uh, and when they were told, oh, you'll have to take your clothes off, people like Liz Fraser or Jill Gascoigne, they, they didn't believe it. Uh, but th yes, they did. Do you think this is wise? <laughs> Don't! The what? Don't stop! Oh, what? Oh, 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 Timothy! Oh, Timothy! I, I should. Oh. Gosh, how rude! Oh, sorry. <laughs> First. Oh. Hello. Hello. Oh. oh, yes. Oh, she likes that. Is he enjoying it too? Mm. Talk to her. Talk to her. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, 
I'm afraid I've made a mess. Already? <laughs> like to see my bottom. It's quite famous. You, I, I always had a pipe that used to come out of my bum, which there would be a little old man with a cigarette going like this, Whoa, bloody hell, which would be squirting bubbles out of my ass. That was his job. What did you do at the office today, darling? Oh, well, I had to stick a pipe up Robin Asquith's ass and blow bubbles out of it. Don't forget also a girl under here who's saying, did you see um, Albert Finney at the National last night in Hamlet? And I'm going to because we are actors, don't forget, so we've got to do the lovey chat. He was saying, marvellous, I thought, you know, I thought he overpaid it just a little bit, I don't know. Mind you, she'd, she would say yes, but it's the sort of part I'd like to get my teeth into. Any case, what they hadn't told me was, I'd asked the question before I got in the bubbles, I said, has it been tested? I said this to Greg Smith, the producer. He said, Rob, it's been tested. How do you test the bubbles? Had someone been in it all night, you know, <laughs> testing it? Well, of course, it was, it was like sulfuric acid. All my fucking bollocks were ruined. Everything, everything was gone. This poor girl. I mean, it's, and, and people say, it must have been fantastic. Wakey, wakey, rise and shine. Oh. Hey, hey oh. <laughs> Molly, will you stop doing that? Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. I believe you must be in the wrong room. Ah, oh, no, she isn't. We're ready for you. Come Play With Me is a very important film indeed. I know this is all relative, but firstly, it was the last blockbuster of the sex film era. Come on, girls, let's get them out! It was also a link with the past because it was directed by uh, George Harrison Marks, who made Naked as Nature Intended. Now, yours should be identical to mine. In the dying days of the industry, uh, it could only be supported by somebody very rich uh, who liked to put his protégés in films. I don't think that David Sullivan knew a great deal about Harrison Marx's history. The only relationship they had was that Marx supplied Sullivan's magazines with photos, and Sullivan thought, maybe, here's an opportunity uh, to get Mary Millington into the movies. Dave Sullivan said, you know, you've got to put Mary in it. And Mary, poor kid, was petrified. He says, George, for God's sake, don't give me any lines to say because, you know, she wasn't an actress. But, you know, obviously he insisted that she was going to be in it. Oh, yes, we'll yes. give you a little massage first. That'll relax <laughs> yes. you. My first time here, you know. <laughs> no need to worry. Oh, my wife recommended I come along because... Uh, oh, we'll, we'll sort you out. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Oh, charming. Beautiful. Oh. Oh. I can't believe that David oh, Sullivan oh. knew what he was oh. doing. What did he think when he saw this film, which uh, consists of grand old British music hall humour? Uh, there is a song and dance scene, you may remember, and Mary appears only fleetingly. Where the hell do you think you're going? It's great to be here. There never, ever could be anywhere else for we. This is where we want to be, here enjoying ourselves. It wouldn't be right to go on criticizing anywhere nice as this. There is such great happiness here for everyone. When Dave Sullivan saw the finish, you know, rough cut, he said, I want a bit more sex in it. And he owned a uh, uh, one of these sauna places in, down in Croydon. So we had to go down there and shoot that extra bit to keep him happy. Pretty girl, 
this was the beginning of Mary Millington's movie career. If she hadn't died, she would have gone on and uh, to who knows what, I think she would have become a very, very big star indeed, whereas, as it was, because she died so young, she was only ever a British raunchy sex symbol. Divine dress. Divine villa. The pornocrats aren't ashamed to be ostentatious anymore. Oh, certainly not. Big business now. It's too bloody big. Where do we stand? The choice between blueprint and blue pencil. Video largely wrecked the sex film business. When hardcore videos became available, uh, no one wanted to see softcore anymore. Suddenly, everything seemed to conspire against us. The Conservatives were mainly to blame. Westminster City Council decided to clean up Soho and uh, completely wrecked the heart of our business. And finally, the cinemas were closing as well. So there was nowhere to show the films. Soon, Elsa was putting the finishing touches to our play home, although we all knew we wouldn't be able to use it for long. Somehow, the days had passed with great rapidity, and our holidays were nearly over. What is Jill up to now? Baby, you're a dream. 